Welcome to our last GCRI event before the summer break, and there's more people coming. Excellent. There's seats everywhere, and there's soft seats on the side, and we have four monitors total, so we're absolutely equipped uh, to do this. Uh, very excited about this. Um, thank you all for coming. I know it's a very hot um, evening, and I'm sure there's other places you could be more comfortably sitting right now uh, with your feet in a pool or something, so I'm very glad you all came. And thank you so much for our speakers to do the same. Uh, I'll be very brief, as usual. Um, I know some of you already know me, but there's also a lot of new faces here today, which is probably due to our extremely exciting topic, the blockchain in the energy transition. Um, blockchain is I call it the unavoidable blockchain event because it feels like blockchain, everybody's talking about it, everybody uh, is proposing startups that use blockchain, uh, you read uh, op-eds and articles on blockchain, but um, only a few people know what it actually is and what it actually does, and we have all four of them here today. Uh, so very excited about that, especially how it relates to energy, because most of us hear blockchain in the context of, say, cryptocurrency, uh, Bitcoin, and so on. But there are other places where um, where this comes up and where, where this can be used and it's uh, a technology that I believe is here to stay and will uh, shape the future to come. So yeah, um, eager to learn more about it. Who am I and why am I talking to you? I am uh, the manager of the German Center for Research and Innovation, as uh, some of you already know. Um, the German Center for Research and Innovation, DWIH, uh, which is the acronym that spells the German branding issue. Uh, we, there's five of us worldwide. We have one in Tokyo, one in Moscow, New Delhi, and Moscow. No, I already mentioned Moscow, Tokyo, New Delhi, Sao Paulo, and uh, Moscow. And we're here in New York, obviously, and I believe all five houses have done something on blockchain at one point or another. Uh, so we're, we're glad to, to be part of that uh, wave. Um, uh, we're funded by the foreign, German Foreign Office, so our mission is to engage in what's called science diplomacy, uh, uh, foster better transatlantic relations through science and innovation, which we're very happy to do. Other than blockchain, the other big topic that we're talking about is artificial intelligence, and you'll see on both topics more to come in the near future. Uh, one thing I will say in terms of housekeeping, uh, you see a beautiful buffet and a beautiful bar set up in the back. We'll hold all this until the end of the event, as usual, if you've been to our events before, for networking and further questions and so on. So, um, uh, what else? Uh, yeah, so very excited to have our first cooperation with the Hochschule Fresenius, University of Applied Sciences Fresenius. Um, and uh, my colleague from their New York office will say a little bit about that in a minute. But before I give Pia the floor, I want to uh, introduce um, the CEO of this wonderful space that we're in now for at least the third or fourth time at Grand Central Tech. Uh, his name is Robinson Hernandez, and he will briefly say a little bit about the space and, uh, and this collaboration. So welcome again, and thank you very much for, for being here tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So thanks so much for joining us tonight on what is a very hot day outside. Um, so for us, to give you a little bit of a feel for what we're trying to do here, uh, we're part of an organization that's called Grand Central Tech. The space that you're in right now is called the Urban Tech Hub, which we developed in partnership with the city of New York. And the idea was how do we find a way of reinforcing the urban tech slash clean tech slash smart city space in New York City. We hear a lot of what's happening throughout the world. Europe is certainly a leader in many of these endeavors. And we want to be able to build on that. And so in partnership with the city, uh, we created what we have here, which is a 50,000 square foot space designed to serve as an innovation hub. And so take a feel, you know, later on, take, uh, feel free to walk around, familiarize yourself with the space. And what you'll see is a fully occupied space with about 55 companies, most of them in clean tech, that are looking at innovative ways of bringing solutions in the clean tech and urban tech space to market. And we've been fortunate that we've been able to partner with such great countries like Germany and Holland and everywhere else, as well as with the city of New York State, Canada, and all that jazz, in being able to develop something here. So thank you so much for participating. We're so happy to be able to welcome you guys here in such 
you know, topics that are so much relevant. We're seeing so much change in blockchain and, ha and blockchain and how that's going to have an impact and what's happening in the energy markets is going to be fascinating. So thank you so much for joining us. Please feel free to walk around. Remember, this is an innovation hub for you guys, for the industry. So uh, thanks so much for joining us here. So cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us, and great support from uh, from your team for our event. So now, with, without further ado, uh, the director of the Hochschule Fresenius New York office, Pia Thanks, Sarah. So I have a piece of paper because I don't want to miss out on the Professor Dr. Jens Strucker. He is the Managing Director of the Institute of Energy Economics, Dean of Digital Energy Management, and Professor in the Faculty of Business and Media, all at the Hochschule of Fresenius. Jens will introduce his esteemed panel and begin the presentations for the evening. But one other thing, I represent Hochschule of Fresenius here in New York. We, have, uh, we are a private business university with campuses across Germany. We are based in Berlin, in Munich, in Hamburg, in Heidelberg, Itstein, Köln, Wiesbaden, Frankfurt, I didn't want to miss anything. So I invite you to please uh, talk to me at the networking reception afterwards. Um, I would be happy to talk about our programming and our activities here in New York. In addition to this, I'd like to just say thank you to Ernst & Young, who has uh, generously sponsored this evening. Thank you very much. So yeah, we... Uh, we heard a lot about um, blockchain and cryptocurrency over the last uh, one or two years. Um, and market, market capitalization of blockchain right now is around more than 300 billion uh, US dollars. So I think it's, it's a good reason to talk about that. And especially what does it mean for energy. So this is why we are here. And um, I think most of the people, not you of course, but most of the people still have a hard time to understand what blockchain really is. And um, my part is now I will give a quick overview of um, what blockchain is. And um, then I um, hand it over to our panelists. So they, will, they will give a brief introduction to what they are doing on blockchain, the energy sector. Uh, we have one uh, presentation by somebody who is missing. That's uh, Ashley, she's a Stanford student and she couldn't show up, unfortunately. Uh, but she has a recorded presentation, so we will have that around five or six minutes or so. Yeah, and after that, of course, I, I open the discussion. And um, yeah, I think I uh, will a short, give a short um, introduction to, to our panelists here. Uh, we have Colleen, she's with GTM Research. And she, she uh, uh, published a study, or GTM published a study, and you did that. Um, very good one. It's about uh, what is happening with the, in the energy sector and who invested in what, who's doing what kind of uh, project, demonstration for a pilot project, etc. how much money is going in that uh, area. So uh, she will talk about that, give us a brief overview. Uh, then we have Scott. He will give us the kind of startup uh, view on that. Uh, Scott is, uh, we, we first met in, in um, I think it was in Essen, in, in Germany, right? And um, so he's in a, involved in a couple of uh, projects in Germany also, in blockchain energy world there. We have a couple of projects there. And um, we, in Germany, uh, we all knew um, LO3, your company, because of your famous um, Brooklyn microgrid, Brooklyn Queens microgrid here, um, and I, I don't know, but uh, this is what how all the newspapers wrote about that, uh, and in Germany, all of a sudden, the discussion started, oh, uh, we don't need utilities anymore, yeah, so it was really a big thing in Germany. Um, yeah, and then uh, at the end, <laughs> we, we didn't say that. <laughs> we, <laughs> and then Andrew will give us uh, the utility perspective, the American utility perspective, on Edison perspective. So I think, um, and after that, we will have, uh, I think, a lively discussion. So um, yeah, wonderful. So let's uh, go on. Um, let me just switch here. Okay. So yeah, our topic is role of blockchain in the energy transition, and um, I think we all have still a hard thing, still a hard time to understand uh, what 
blockchain really is. And I think it's up to John Oliver to explain it. He said recently, it's everything you don't understand about money combined with everything you don't understand about computers. And I think this is a pretty good one. Last week I gave a presentation here to, um, to uh, the New York Energy um, Association and uh, there at least there were a lot of econ economists, uh, so this was pretty good for them. But the problem is you need both, those views on that. And um, I think it doesn't make a lot of sense to uh, explain what blockchain is, what, how does it work. We already have different kind of blockchains. Instead, I think it's much better to come up with a, a description, what kind of problem it solves and what it is. So um, I think it's important to know that it's kind of a decentralized network, a crypto network. Right? It provides a, a variety of digital services. And you need kind of tokens for that as an internal currency. You know, it's important for the incentive mechanism there. And underlying to that, there we have blockchain, and blockchain is just the technology to do, to do that. This, in a nutshell, is kind of the idea here. Um, and still, I think it's important that we talk about what kind of solution uh, blockchain or where it helps. Uh, for common saying here that uh, blockchain is a hammer looking for nails, and I wanted to show you three nails. So where I see the, the where's the promising, where the, where are the good um, things that we can address with uh, blockchain. So one thing is intermediation, and this is all about trust. Because if you look at the internet today, um, we have a big problem. We cannot exchange money or digital goods directly and without an intermediary. That's a problem with, with blockchain uh, in general, uh, sorry, with the internet in, uh, in general. And why? The reason for that is um, nobody um, can keep you from do a copy from what I sent you. Uh, you can copy any photo, etc., and give it away. In, the only uh, way to, to say, okay, we can, we can do this and I can uh, really keep you from doing that is by an intermediate. We can do encryption, then we have to exchange keys, but then we need kind of some kind of central intermediary to do that, to be responsible for this. Yeah, and um, I think it's, uh, you could ask, uh, is it a problem at all? I mean, say, why intermediary is a good thing? What's what, what the problem? And um, there is a problem, at least there are two. One is, um, of course, it is costly to have an intermediary. You pay for that, there's a margin to pay. Uh, it's not very efficient in most of the cases today in the internet. And the other thing is, think about um, banking, and transferring money, etc. And the other thing is, of course, you have a single point of failure. We learned that recently with Facebook, etc. So the internet giants, there's a problem with that. And also with your, with your own data. But still you could say, okay, do we really need it for business? If you look at Amazon and one-click payment, you say, well, why do I need a kind of direct payment or something else than uh, this kind of internet infrastructure we have today? Um, and yeah, I would say there is uh, still um, a lot of um, more going on there. If you look at the um, Amazon story, with Amazon, it's not digitized at all. I mean, you have a kind of promise, you give a promise that things are paid. You, give a pr you have a promise there that your money will be transferred, etc., etc. But all the settlements, the financial settlements behind that, it takes weeks, sometimes weeks, um, the settlement. So it's not efficient and it's not very quick. So this is the idea with intermediation and where blockchain comes in here is um, if with blockchain as a technology you really can do an exchange of payment and also the good in itself, the digital good, immediately. You can exchange things, digital things between strangers. You do not have to know each other. And we don't have that in the internet yet. That's one thing where um, blockchain can help. And now if you think of, um, of the energy world, we have a lot of intermediation, a lot of intermediation. Uh, a lot of ways where we need kind of uh, trust of third parties. So this is uh, where all the interesting thing starts. And we see that uh, we, could, um, we could automate a lot of things. And when it comes to automation, with blockchain, most of us have heard about Bitcoin, etc., and this is just transferring money. But with blockchain, 
with other blockchain platforms, the so-called smart uh, contract platforms, you can even run entire programs on the blockchain. This means you, you can automate entire business processes, business logics, completely. And we already have seen an, an uh, venture capitalist, a venture capital company on the blockchain, and it worked. They raised a lot of, lot of uh, money. Uh, and then they had a tiny problem, but this is uh, another story. So the idea is here we can exchange things uh, directly uh, bes between strangers, and we also can do this, of course, uh, with energy. Energy is not a digital good, of course, but uh, the right to do this, we, we can exchange, or uh, the right who owns the, uh, the electrons here. And as we connect more and more intermittent uh, renewals to the grid, the, the idea is that all these kind of um, um, challenges to the grid, to the distribution grid operator, um, there we have maybe a problem what, uh, which uh, um, a blockchain really can solve. This means that we have a coordination problem there, and um, this is the idea. And if I say renewables, uh, in Germany alone we have 1.6 million um, renewables uh, installed. Uh, so we already have a problem there. This, uh, we, we connected them to the grid, by their, but they bear no risk at all. They just feed in their um, electricity and that's it. But they are not really an active part of the market right now. Uh, and it, we have to improve that. We have to, um, have to come up with solutions here. But we will, uh, uh, we will hear about that from the panelists uh, a little bit later. So, second promise of blockchain is data usage control. And um, maybe I can give you an, an, an uh, example here. If, um, think about smart meter data, all the consumption data you have, yeah, and uh, as a utility in Germany, we are uh, deregulated, so uh, a retailer can uh, show up and say, okay, I, I want to give you an, a new tariff, and it's individualized, exactly to you, wonderful. But please give me your data, and we will find out whether it's worth or not. So if you can earn, if we have a win-win situation of uh, both of us or not. And the problem is, it's a chicken-egg problem. If I give you the data, the data is gone. And with blockchain, you can come up with a solution like we put an application on top of a, of a blockchain, and the utility, for instance, could just um, do the analysis with the data just once. So you keep in control uh, over the data, you be in control over your data, and especially in Europe now with GDPR, um, maybe this is a good idea. Uh, and maybe not only there. So this is um, number two. And then finally I have number three, and this is my favorite one. Um, think about the situation with, um, with network effects. Today we have five big um, utility, uh, five big internet giants in, in the US. We have two more in uh, China, Alibaba and Tencent. And they all live, um, they all exist because of network effects. Uh, the economy, economists uh, call this double-sided or both-sided markets here, and um, I want to explain that. Uh, but uh, the thing is, obviously we have many good and promising digital services, but they fail. Why? Uh, most of them fail today because startups there um, have a bootstrapping problem. So if you think about Twitter, the first Twitter message we change the value is quite low, of course, uh, sure. But um, think about if you can, could give somebody kind of incentive, a fraction of a service, of a value, of a token, um, and this could be a kind of financial um, incentive to do this. And exactly this kind of financial incentive, maybe blockchain can help you. It would be, um, if you look at this slide here, you can see on the, on the left, um, we see kind of here the, the, the green curve, financial utility. Tokens, this is nothing else than a kind of digit, digitalized, um, digitized right. Yeah, and uh, you can issue tokens with, uh, with the blockchain, of course. Most of you have heard about the initial coin offering. This is just on the application level, level but even on the blockchain level, if you, uh, if you issue um, in uh, sorry, a token, 
uh, one option is you can um, you can um, you can issue a work token or usage token. Usage token is nothing else, and you need a token to do kind of thing kind of stuff. So, for instance, with Bitcoin, you need a Bitcoin in order to transfer money. Sure. Then we have a work token, and this means you do a service for the network, and you get a re reward for that. And if you just combine or in a, uh, combine a work and a usage token in a smart way. You can maybe you can get rid of uh, this kind of bootstrap problem we have. So and now if you think, okay, nice idea, an academic idea, um, it's years away or so. No, it's not. Actually, uh, we already have seen a couple of interesting things going on here. Yeah? One is Filecoin. A couple of you may might have heard of that. It's a company. It's not really a company. The network is a company. So if you want to invest in Andreessen and Horowitz, for instance, they invested a lot of money but they had to buy the tools, and there was no investment into a company, it's just the network they invest. And the Filecoin mean, the idea is uh, you exchange, or you, you have your laptop, we have our tablets, we have our mobiles, and we have a lot of space there. So we can store um, files there, and then we exchange it, and you get paid for a kind of uh, work token that, that you store things there, or you can transfer it, whatever. And uh, there are good reasons to do that, this is uh, another story, but uh, the, the interesting part now for uh, for the energy sector is think about making use of this kind of um, of uh, environment of this kind of incentive structure to finance, uh, for instance, a smart grid to finance uh, shared investment. If you have an apartment building block there and uh, you want to invest into a PV rooftop installation, you want to invest in. Uh, kind of EV chargers, whatever. And so you can invest and with uh, blockchain solutions and tokens and also with, if you combine this with metering, it's, it's a pretty nice way to, to get rid, rid of the problem with investing upfront uh, in, in an in a infrastructure. So um, very promising uh, things and we have a couple of, um, couple of use cases for that already in Germany, around the world, uh, yeah, and I'm happy to talk about that later on. So, now we go on with um, the presentation by um, Ashley, and yeah, I, I will try that. So maybe one more word with regard to Ashley. Ashley is, uh, as I um, told you, she's a student uh, uh, at Stanford, and I met her a couple of weeks ago, and I think this is uh, important. Um, she showed up at an event in, uh, in Berlin, it's called the Event Horizon, and more than 1,000 people came there just to talk about blockchain in the energy sector. And I shared an academic deep dive session there, and she submitted a paper, and I thought she represents the next generation, and it would be a good idea to see what, what she wants to talk about, uh, what she wants to tell us about uh, blockchain in the energy section, uh, sector, and what uh, maybe what kind of potential uh, she sees. So I will start in a second. And then we have to check whether the well, it's loud enough. Hi everyone, my name is Ashley Kuchin. I'm a PhD student at Stanford University and a researcher at the Select National Accelerator Lab with the Grid Integration Systems and Mobility Group. My apologies for not being able to join uh, the panel this evening in person. Uh, due to unforeseen circumstances, but uh, I'm delighted to still have the opportunity uh, to share some of the research we've been doing uh, out here uh, with all of you. So um, I'd like to uh, spend the next couple of minutes uh, sh sharing with you how uh, we're working towards enabling 100% clean energy for all and the role of blockchain in the energy transition. So first we need to look at what's happening in energy today. Currently, there's an energy resource coordination problem. Power grids as we know them do not have a strong multi-tier coordination framework. There's still difficulty in load uh, resources uh, and controlling these resources. Um, in the eyes of the utility, distributed energy is seen as both a threat and an opportunity. And in addition, um, how we utilize data, how we translate that data um, into information that, that we can use uh, for knowledge and decision making in order to take uh, action and then take that action and feed that back into 
um, our data collection methods has still not been fully achieved. Um, and we feel that interoperability standards alone do not solve this problem. Um, just at the uh, data end of the spectrum, big data alone isn't enough to solve this issue. Um, and as we begin to integrate deep learning methods, machine learning, et cetera, uh, this alone cannot solve uh, this coordination problem. So we're really trying to look at this from the perspective of resource observability, controllability, controllability and overall system stability. What's happening now with this uh, new technology known as blockchain, which all of you um, are here this evening to uh, discuss, and I think uh, the cover of the most recent uh, MIT Tech Review magazine uh, sums it up very nicely. Uh, this technology has a lot of potential. Uh, however, it's caught currently in the infamous hype cycle, and um, trying to weed out uh, what are the real potential applications um, and uh, real opportunities uh, to be had here. And uh, my personal belief and, and uh, my colleagues what we're working on is uh, really trying to pinpoint and address some key pain points um, from the perspective of utility companies and where blockchain can um, achieve some of the gaps that we're currently facing in transactive energy. But first of all, it's easy to see that in just the last two years since October 2016 when blockchain and energy first took off, there are now a number of new startups as well as incumbents um, who have a seat at the table and are looking at uh, new ways to utilize this technology um, and also address uh, our changing energy systems. Specifically though, uh, where our research here at Stanford and Slack focuses on are the top three. So we're looking at transactive energy from the perspective of peer-to-peer -peer energy trading, decentralized energy exchanges, and uh, EV charging. But as you can see, um, from this uh, great chart from a recent report uh, by GTN Research. Um, there are a lot of different ways uh, people are uh, looking at blockchain applications uh, in energy. What I'd like to present and just talk about for uh, the remaining minutes um, is the research we're looking at specifically for uh, the energy industry. So being able to look at uh, crypto and uh, transactive control, um, or as we call it, crypto control. <coughs> so um, for all of you in the room, uh, you're probably familiar with proof of work, proof of authority, maybe proof of stake. And there's a whole plethora of other uh, consensus mechanisms and algorithms that have come onto the scene in just the last year. We feel that uh, the algorithms that are currently out there and the different consensus mechanisms that are out there uh, are not appropriate for uh, how we envision um, successful uh, transactive energy systems. So uh, some of my colleagues have been involved in the Olympic Peninsula and uh, Columbus, Ohio uh, transactive energy pilots. And based on the results of those pilot projects, uh, we felt that there were some uh, opportunities for blockchain to address uh, some of the shortcomings of transactive. Namely, you'll see um, what we feel are what are the requirements for uh, crypto control? Um, and so we feel that the seven uh, requirements of measurements and event logging, transformation, filtering, and calculation, analysis, and optimization, forecasting, bidding, and out-of-market trading, scheduling, dispatch, and regulation, settlements and payments, and finally, monitoring, oversight, and penalties all offer um, avenues uh, to utilize blockchain technology uh, with Transactive and uh, this new algorithm that we're currently developing that we've uh, uh, coined uh, Proof of Control. So we've uh, currently submitted a couple of um, proposals to the U.S. Department of Energy to uh, test out and further develop um, this system and this mechanism um, that would require both um, hardware and software development and uh, what's unique to this as well is we're really trying to understand um, the potential for shared uh, community energy resources and also what are the social implications in terms of how do you onboard uh, different communities uh, to utilize this technology, whether through a mobile application, uh, et cetera. But if this is truly uh, to be the next technology uh, similar to the internet, uh, how do we make sure that everyone is included and um, this technology could actually offer opportunities for clean energy access? So these are some of the questions that we're addressing 
um, and putting forward, and I'd be happy to uh, receive any emails uh, to further this discussion. Uh, thank you very much, and I uh, wish you a great rest of the evening uh, on the panel. Thanks. If you have questions, uh, we can maybe you can uh, you can ask them later on, and we take them. At least we can try. Hi everyone. Uh, good evening, and excited to be here and talk a little bit about where we see the market over at GCM Research. I'm an analyst there. My focus uh, is primarily on microgrids and then started moving into blockchain applications specifically focused on grid edge, uh, the grid edge side. So where we're really touching the distribution grid, touching the customer. Um, so past year, we've seen about $450 million invested in blockchain energy companies. Um, over 150 companies working in the blockchain energy space. I'll say that this number you should think of not as startups. Um, this will include a lot of startups. We've had, I think, 30 new startups in 2018. We had uh, a, a bunch in, in 2017, and but it also is gonna include companies like IBM that have entered the blockchain energy space pretty aggressively, um, and other sort of large players, uh, old companies that maybe did more middleware offering APIs and are now, or offering APIs and are now trying to enter the space as well. And um, we also try and track the projects that are happening globally. And so there's over 50 projects globally uh, to date. Um, this, Slide here is as of Q1 2018, where we tracked 40 deployed and 33 planned public demonstrations, pilots, and projects. Um, a few things I want to note here. I know it can be kind of hard to see exactly where things are. Um, the colors are sort of the stage the project is at. It's not as important. It's important is the size of the bubble. So you'll notice uh, the US, Australia, and Europe have both um, large bubbles as well as, I mean, Europe obviously has many because it's a lot of countries going on there, but uh, Germany and the Netherlands are the two overlapping bubbles that are the largest there. And what I think this shows both is where we're seeing investment. Um, obviously, it's been, has been mentioned a few times tonight, Germany has uh, high penetration of distributed energy resources, as does Australia. Australia has lots of places where the penetration of rooftop solar is, you know, above 50% uh, on a feeder, which is a lot, of, a lot of solar for a grid to deal with. And when you don't know where resources are in the grid, it can become difficult to manage them. And so one of the places where we're seeing blockchain be used uh, a lot is in creating exchanges and market management uh, platforms that enable things like peer-to-peer -peer energy trading that can help uh, utilities know or consumers on the grid know where these resources are so that you can better manage them and create these controls. But what I want to focus on today, I think uh, Scott will cover some things related to how uh, his company, LO3, looks at projects. Um, but I want to dive into a couple other different use cases that we're seeing. And I want to use things happening in Europe and the US, uh, since we're based here. And uh, Germany is an important part of tonight's presentation uh, to sort of go over what, you know, what these projects can look like because I think when you hear blockchain and energy, it can mean a lot of different things. So uh, the first is EV charging. So obviously with EVs, uh, with electric vehicles, we have a lot of potential because there's not a lot of infrastructure on how EV charging works, what the platforms look like, how interoperability will function. And so in uh, one company, Motion Work, uh, had a project called Oslo to Rome, where they were testing interoperability of different EV charging stations. And so that went through um, seven different partners and multiple companies, in including Germany. Uh, and they were able to sort of show that you could charge and discharge using this blockchain wallet across these different countries. Uh, one area that I think is interesting uh, and is has fewer transactions and so fewer scalability problems on blockchain is the wholesale trading side. And so there's a company uh, called Ponton that has been doing a consortium with 39 uh, different large energy users uh, and companies in Europe to deal with uh, wholesale trading. And so they're trying to create a layer um, that would be equivalent to parts of the wholesale energy market where you could communicate and do bilateral trades. 
And that's something that they've been working on as sort of a shadow test network over the past eight months or so. And then I think on where we were you know, getting at in the last presentation a little bit is this grid flexibility. So the ability to uh, use blockchain to know when, or both to submit bids, accept bids, and then also to know if someone has participated in the marketplace. And so IBM has been working uh, with Sonnen and also the transmission system operator Tenet to send signals via blockchain to manage residential storage systems as a way to provide flexibility in the energy market. And so that's a pilot that's also ongoing. Um, I know I'm getting low on time here, so I <laughs> want to run through some US projects as well. Um, so one that I'm, so I'm, I'm going to skip over the Omega Grid one. I'll go quickly. That's distribution management. Um, one of the other areas that I'm pretty excited about for blockchain's potential that I don't think gets talked about as often in the energy space is its potential in cybersecurity. So the US Department of Energy actually contracted um, a cybersecurity company, Guard Time, as well as some, na and is working also with some national labs and universities um, to look at how blockchain can be used for a cybersecurity at the grid edge. And so if you think as you're bringing on all these different devices uh, onto the grid edge, you're also increasing the sort of vulnerability of attack in certain locations. And there's a real potential with the identity management that blockchain can have in order to help potentially allay some of those issues. And so I think that's something that I, I like to look into in addition to what's happening on the distribution side. Um, and so with that, I guess this is all to say there's a lot happening here and there's a lot of different use cases being um, discussed and I think everyone's you know going back to the hammer nail comment um, everyone's looking at the different things and so the places I get excited about is flexibility on the grid um, what you're doing around EV transactive energy and then also cybersecurity thank you Uh, my name is Scott Kessler. I am meant to represent the hype part of that block tonight, I think. Um, and I come from a company called LO3 Energy. We're headquartered in Brooklyn with an office in Portland, about 30 employees, and maybe about four or five years old now, which makes us quite old in the space. And we really, you know, we think blockchain is, you know, we've covered this a little bit, Ashley touched on it, but as we move towards where we have billions of devices that live at the grid edge, how do we coordinate? How do we actually facilitate that activity in a productive fashion? And we really don't see any way that a sort of centralized command and control model can be deployed at that scale. So what is the problem we're trying to solve? It is the scale of distributed energy that we face. And how do you best um, take the value that each one of those devices can provide to the grid, whether it's charging, whether it's storing, whether it's producing, and how do you, in the most economically efficient way, ensure that the grid gets the services it needs in the location that it needs them? And that's really the role that we see blockchain um, taking on. Now, that means a lot of things. I'm going to talk through sort of how we view it at a high level. But the problem, that is sort of the problem. And what we and a lot of the other folks in the space are trying to do right now is figure out what is the business model that gets us there. You know, we think this is the right technology for it. We have a pretty good idea what are some of the right use cases, but we are all trying to figure out the business model right now. And anyone who tells you they've got it figured out is probably lying to you or they're hiding some really good secrets because it's really the thing we are all working through in the space together right now. So for us, we think this inevitably leads to this idea of a local community, call it a microgrid, call it a marketplace, call it a self-consuming community as they like to call it in Europe. Whatever you call it, it's these assets that live within proximity to one another. And what we need to do is get to a world where we can begin calling upon the resource that we need in a specific location. So whether that is I live in Brooklyn and I want to buy local clean energy and it should probably be cheapest for me to buy that from a neighbor because if you think about the physics of that, well then we should probably design the economics to reflect that. Or whether we're talking about a transmission operator and they want to relieve congestion in a very specific part of their network, but they have no visibility down into what's happening at the grid edge. How do they purchase the flexibility that they want? Because that's really what they're trying to do at the end of the day is buy it from someone. Whether you have a predetermined contract and they get to control it themselves, or whether it's, as we like to say, price as a proxy for control, so that you know, you know what everyone's price preference at, what price will turn off lights, I'm willing to turn down the thermostat, all of these flexibility options I might have, 
If you know the price options, then you can basically just choose in real time how much capital do I need to deploy to solve that problem. We see this all coming back to this idea of a local community microgrid. So we began deploying these in Brooklyn back in April 2016. We did the first ever transaction of energy or energy attributes over a blockchain. Um, and we have since sort of been scaling this. And you know, where we think this really leads is the idea that you know, not just these microgrids, which we think can be used to provide new opportunities for distribution utilities for retailers, um, in addition to sort of the threat that comes from this. But we also think it moves us into a world where we can just begin sharing data among users. Because if you think about everything I'm talking about today, it's predicated on the idea that I am either providing a service or I'm providing data. Those are the two things I can be doing. And in order to facilitate these services, whether it's just the sale of energy in a wholesale market, whether it is this flexibility opportunity we have, whether it's anything else, it is about data being shared among users. And so that is really what we have come to define as our platform, what we're trying to do. We're actually in the process of scaling this into a global platform. Uh, we're doing actually a token sale to try and get us there because you know, we think we know where we need to go, but it's going to be a hard road and there are some capital concerns, as you mentioned. How do we get there? How do we bootstrap ourselves? So a token sale is a good way to do that. But we think this platform is really one across which these services are offered. So where are we today is we have about nine projects globally. Um, we are looking to test out a lot of these different models. So in Europe, you know, we are testing local community microgrids with two German distribution utilities. We're also working with a wholesale market provider there, Epic Spot, to test what happens when one of these local energy marketplaces wants to participate in the wholesale market. Um, we're doing a project in Australia with the Australian government, with the market operator, and with the distribution utility to look at a large number of dairies that all have big pieces of equipment that when you turn them on, they have really high amounts of demand for short periods. So how do we coordinate that in some sort of marketplace, not just using what we know about the, about the um, end devices available there, but also using information about the grid. So we've partnered with Siemens to actually take, tech, take information about the grid assets themselves and incorporate that into the market. So that's really where we see this going, where we have a distributed, we have these distributed resources, combining that with the information about the grid itself and trying to make use of markets to achieve grid effects. And that's really where we see ourselves focusing in the future. So thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. My name is Andrew Reed. Um, I work in Condens and Utility the Future Department. Um, I've been there for about six months so far, but mostly working over the last four years in the Research and Development Department, where we originally started taking a look at this. Um, so talking a little bit about Con Edison and, and what's going on here. Um, just to let you everybody know, you know, so we're a dis transmission distribution utility. Um, we provide the pipes, wires, and everything under the ground to, for the electric, gas, and steam systems in the five boroughs of Westchester, five boroughs of New York and Westchester, um, as also with our counterparts with Orange and Rockland Utilities, we also are part of the, the family there. Um, so just provide a little bit of background. Um, so you may be familiar with REV or Reforming the Energy Vision, and they have a variety of tracks. There's typically three tracks in the regulatory proceeding around REV. Um, so specifically around track one, which is focused around implementation, it's focused on developing kind of a distribu distribution level market design, what the technical platform should be, um, and how you go about integrating system planning and operations with new business models, ownership of DER, market participation, and so on. Um, and one of the, the orders coming out of the REV proceeding was that utilities will serve as this distributed system platform. Um, and there's really, when we think about the platform in general, we think about it having these three components. One, integrated distribution system planning, um, meaning that we're facilitating the, 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 uh, a streamlined process for how we interconnect distributed energy resources to the system. Um, we're providing to the public and stakeholders uh, hosting capacity maps in terms of where would be the cheapest places to deploy distributed energy resources and the cheapest interconnection points so you could understand as a signal to the market like this is where we um, where the highest value could be or where we could host the most um, DER, um, improve data sharing and information, um, and, and just overall a management system in where we can manage these resources on, the, on our system in a, in, a, in a more effective manner. 
Um, we think about grid operations, so we talk about utilizing, you know, monitoring and control um, such that we can operate the system in an efficient way. Um, you know, we talk about what we control, but also what are, the, what are the technologies and tools that are required to facilitate more demand, um, from an operation standpoint, to facilitate more demand management onto the system, whether we're doing it or a customer, we're signaling our customers to do that, um, or and also demand response. Um, and then further down the line around market operations, you know, sending those transparent time signals, um, more participate, helping our customers participate in both what the NISO market coordination, as well as whatever um, services to the distribution system we may be we may be operating. How does data enable a lot of that to happen? Um, a lot of this is underpinned by um, a lot of supporting functions. So as like we're rolling out AMI across the system today, um, advanced metering infrastructure, um, updating the you know the website and digital um, interactions with our customers. Um, and so on. So just kind of moving around along there. Uh, we think a lot of the blockchain properties closely align with that of the, what we think the future of this distributed platform should be in terms of security, which was talked about, um, robustness in terms of eliminating different points of failure with this kind of distributed um, nature of the technology, transparency in terms of data and data ownership and how do you facilitate um, um, trust on the network. Um, scalability was addressed here um, in terms of you know a lot of the solutions today um, or proof of concepts today really don't require a blockchain but when those solutions scale to where we think the future state will be um, we believe blockchain kind of aligns with that and also empowering the customer you know people to have ownership over the data democrat um, a bit of democratization um, when it comes to um, you know data ownership and participation but it, I, thought, I thought this was quite appropriate. Um, this was a Dilbert article going back in 1995, where instead of blockchain, it was actual SQL database. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was hilarious. Like, you know, you walk by and say, well, we need blockchain. But, but you know, the hammer looking for a nail problem. And, you know, you read about it in trade journals. You hear about cryptocurrency. Um, and people are like, do I really need a blockchain? Um, and do I really understand it at all? Do I understand what I'm even talking about? Um, and so the approach that we're taking is really to look at you know, what does it mean to actually implement blockchain across Con Edison? Um, what are the problems that we're trying to solve? What's the business case for utilizing blockchain? Even though we know these problems that then need to be solved, and these are valid use cases to explore, why is blockchain the solution versus any other solution? Um, this is a, a, a kind of a roadmap, high level roadmap that's available on Slideshare, the links in the slide deck. Um, but we're also collaborating with our New York State utilities to look at what are the use cases that actually, that we can share in, um, that would say that you know maybe all these utilities are part of the shared um, network, um, and we're thinking about the use, same use cases. Um, so and that's an effort going on on the right here. With we're working with you know National Grid, um, Avon Grid, um, NIPA, um, and working with a consultant like Indigo um, to kind of facilitate that engagement. So we're doing you know um, a lot there. So thank you. So let's start the uh, discussion. Uh, Colleen, Colleen the, the first one is, uh, goes to you. Um, in a recent interview I read, you, you said the community needs to actually start building products that can be used in mass markets. So uh, how, what do you think? I mean, how far away I mean, um, actual products, actual services, when, we, when will we see that operation? That's a, that's maybe a Scott question. <laughs> um, no, um, so I what I think is important is that when we see pilots happening, there there's communication um, afterwards. So from a perspective of you know how, how will we get there, when will we get there? I think a lot of what gets discussed is this sort of long term. Uh, which I think is important, it's like where the vision comes from, it's where blockchain becomes really, uh, where I think it becomes really transformational, is sort of in this long-term, you know, DSP model, or distribution level markets, um, you know, community microgrids, whatever whatever you want to call them. Um, but in the in the day-to-day, the -day, I think a lot of where we're seeing uh, blockchain being used now is in more of these accounting, uh, accounting mechanisms, right? So thinking about it from a Rex perspective or from, um, you know, even more of like a retail side perspective, just to show, okay, this is what the technology is, this is to show it's working. Um, 
there is a lot of hype happening, and so as you sort of go go down the hype cycle, you need to think about making sure that people understand where the real value can be. Um, so I think it's important to sort of have this long-term vision and also to get projects in the ground. Uh, you mentioned Rex and Rex uh, means oh, sorry. renewable energy credits. Yeah, and um, so or other forms of you know carbon accounting, right? So being able to price carbon, being able to pay for that, and being able to trade it in a way that's transparent. So uh, you have a global look on that. And uh, do you see a common denominator? Is, is, so what is, the, what is the problem today? Is it, is it more technology or is it more um, a regulation? For, block, say, for, for blockchain? blockchain to, why do we see, we see a lot of pilots, but real? Yeah, real well I think, yeah, I mean, I think there's a few things there. I think there's generally in the energy space the you know the phrase "death by pilot," which is you know <laughs> technologies failing to get out of the pilot stage, um, because it's there's a lot of different. I mean, to answer your question, reg regulations vary by in the U.S. by state, by you know by region. There's different ways to bid into different markets. Those regulations are changing, uh, and then you have other countries, right? So if you're a technology vendor trying to enter multiple countries, you're now dealing with you know dozens, hundreds, I mean, I'm sure <laughs> hundreds of different regulations. Uh, but in blockchain specifically, I mean, I think it's both. I think there's a scalability issue that's happening in blockchain still um, that I don't think will be a long-term barrier. I think that there are really smart people working on the different ways to get around scalability issues and different ways of, you know, there's a lot, I mean, we could spend a whole day talking about blockchain technology underlying architectures, I'm sure. Um, but then I think on the regulatory side, that's where the higher risks are for me. Scott, I mean, um, you, you mentioned that you are still looking for a business model, or all, all the startups are looking for a business model even when you are at when you address this kind of P2P model. So um, is it everywhere the same in, uh, over the world? Or? Yeah, I mean, and I don't think that's unique to startups. I actually think the distribution utilities are in the same boat. They are looking for their business model right now. They know what the old one was, deploying capital, they get a guaranteed return on that. It did really well for a long time, got us to where we are, but we've all sort of come to the realization that that has to change. I mean, you look at projects like BQDM, that hurts Con Edison's bottom line. They wouldn't be doing this if they didn't recognize that they need to be figuring out what is their role in the future. Um, so I think both startups and utilities are sort of working together to try to figure this out. I think the easy first use cases are the ones where you don't run into regulation. It will be sort of enterprise blockchain solutions. How do we, how do we better track equipment you know, across many vendors and a utility and different folks who need to know where that is and how to pay for it? Um, how do you, you know, how do you begin tracking recs? You know, some of these things that the regulation exists to do it today. How do we, how do we create a new form of an energy retailer who's maybe doing the exact same thing that someone else did before, but they're using blockchain to do it in a more efficient manner. You know, I think those are the ones that we'll see at scale. Some of the stuff that we and others are trying to do, where it's you know peer to peer, it's trying to envision a new role for the grid. That's going to take a while. You know, that's both a technological and a regulatory barrier that you're pushing up against. It's high risk, but it's high reward too. So you know, we're, we think it's fun. It's fun to be doing it now, at least. We'll see where it goes. So, Andrew, what's uh, what's your view on this? I mean, what what do you think will we see first? Um, is this more a kind of rack solution, or is it more so automation, automating processes? So I think if you look at it the way, like the internet evolved, right, and the different protocols and things expand, I think there's a there's a how novel is what you're trying to achieve um, in terms of you know how complex is the process. Right, you talk about regulatory and technology challenges associated with peer-to-peer, -peer, right? That's significantly uh, different process um, and engagement with utilities and regulators. But then you also have the complexity in terms of how many people are involved, right? You know, how many stakeholders, customers, regulators, ESCOs, energy service providers, utilities, and so on, and how it varies across different regions and so on. So I think low complexity, low novelty is going to be the where, and I think Scott just highlighted around you know, supply chain data exchange and information, um, those kind of to get a good understanding around how the technology works and then start to scaling that into, into different um, solutions. So I believe, and then once you solve the data exchange and privacy issues, you start scaling into these peer-to-peer -peer transactions and all the other complex use cases. But those real more you know, internal processes maybe, 
and then building the business case off of those where you're, you're redu increasing efficiencies, reducing O&M um, costs, and, and moving the needle on those. And then as you, the technology grows and matures, you start branching out into these more complex use cases like transactive energy and so on in the long run, especially as DER penetration starts increasing over time. Um, so. Yeah, maybe we can talk about our second, um, uh, second um, on the more on the technical side. And, uh, if you look at blockchains today, we have a couple of totally different blockchains. We have uh, public blockchains, we have private blockchains, we have more <coughs> kind of smart contract platforms, um, a lot of different uh, things. And Colin, you, you mentioned this German startup um, who was trying to, to enable kind of roaming for, for charging EVs. Uh, or come up with a roaming solution. And they had the problem at the end of last year with the price of Ether uh, going up because of all the speculation. They had to stop their, their pilot because it was too expensive to run a smart contract to pay for that. So this is, uh, right, I mean. Right, so I mean, I think what you're seeing in most deployments today is most companies are using either a private blockchain they've built or a private version of Ethereum. So they've taken Ethereum and they've created it to be proof of authority or something along those lines so that they can control the transaction costs. Um, so from that perspective, I also, I mean, going back to internet ideas, I think that there's, well, there's sort of two things. One is there's the potential for a, an energy specific blockchain. Um, over here, we have, have one of the contenders, uh, Extra G is uh, LO3's blockchain that they're building. Um, there's a couple other consortium that are looking to do similar projects. Uh, I also think it's possible that in sort of the permissioned versus permissionless, open, you know, private versus public blockchain world, uh, if you think of a private blockchain sort of like an intranet, um, we are seeing a lot of development on private or permissions blockchains now because people don't understand how your data is shared on a public blockchain. Uh, they don't know how, what the cost of transactions are going to be. There's too much volatility happening. Uh, similarly, when the internet started, most people had intranets. Uh, people didn't believe that you should be able to share data with someone across the world because that would be unsafe and unwise. Now today, um, you might still have an intranet in your office space to keep things that are really secure and shouldn't be open to the public, but every company also has a public website. Um, and so I think that we'll see more of that shift happening over time in the blockchain technology space, where we'll have things that need to be kept private, they'll be on private change, but everything will be able to communicate a lot more, and I think blockchains will also be able to communicate with each other. I would also just say that the grid itself is private. You know, it's, it's not, it, yes, it aligns very closely to the population, but it, you do have to pass certain restrictions to connect. You know, you do have to be registered with your distribution utility, potentially a retailer, an ESCO as well. So it's not that, you know, the grid is this great open thing. You know, the entire world is not connected to each other. And so we don't really need one blockchain to connect all of us if we are talking about energy use cases. Now, there are different, you know, Rex is something different. You could trade that if you're trying to create a global market. But the way we look at it is, you know, we think a private structure is appropriate because it is a private physical thing that we're trying to create a sort of data infrastructure to reflect. And also, it's not that, you know, these use cases have to be a single blockchain. You could maybe have a blockchain that operates at the local level that has to be very fast acting because that is where, you know, you have sub-second time intervals to react before you blow a transformer or something like that. And as you start scaling up and you think about the way that the grid is architected as well, you know, you start moving to the substation level, to the, to the transmission level, you can have slower response time. So maybe the attributes of the blockchains or non-blockchains at each of those levels can be different. So it's not to say that there's one blockchain to rule them all. You can, and we haven't, you know, companies are still testing this out, trying to figure it out, but there's a lot of experimentation that has to happen there. So the thing is here. Interoperability, of course, is, is key here. So if you want to use a token between different blockchains, etc., so that's a challenge and also a big opportunity, of course. So I think it's time to open it up for the audience, of course. But first, um, do we have a micro here? Just looking for that. No. So please, sir, uh, stand up and. 
Uh, Scott mentioned about that uh, business model. My question actually is about the legal framework. Uh, regulations is one issue, but the issue, uh, uh, the other issue is about our contract law, our commercial uh, uh, terms. Uh, technology on one side has gone at a very rapid speed, and we are using still very old contract laws, very old, outdated uh, commercial terms. So in international market or in domestic market, how we are going to co-op with uh, those terms? Yeah, I mean, I would say there, it's a very big topic, you know, how does smart contracts, how do blockchain reflect what is the legal law and the, you know, case law that supports these contracts? And it's a bigger topic than I can answer. I would just say that from the energy use case, there is a very big reason why we partner with either distribution utilities or retailers to enter each market. And that's because that contract law changes country to country. And we're not going to understand that. Our partner has to understand that. We are developing sort of a software solution with them. And we're going to hopefully go to market together. But that local understanding is really what they're bringing to the table. So the hope is not that a startup like me has to know all of that individually, but rather when I go to them with a sort of um, a technical roadmap for this project and say, here are the smart contracts we will be developing for this, they can run that by their lawyers who are familiar with the local legislation in Australia or the Netherlands or wherever else we're operating. So the hope is not that one company takes that all on and assumes that we're not going to cross any red lines because we're an American startup. We're going to cross all sorts of red lines. Uh, I will say I'll talk about sandboxes is a good yeah. time to talk about that. Is just like in the financial sector, there are sand regulatory sandboxes for you to test and evaluate things so that based on the results of that demonstration that I can inform future policy, maybe legal and so on. Rev, Rev, as part of the reform of the energy vision, um, they built a regulatory, essentially a regulatory sandbox around doing business model demonstrations. So the purpose of those business model demonstrations are to inform future policy decisions um, and understand where the where are the new business models, both for utilities or in collaboration with third parties. Um, how could we jointly kind of you know make money? Um, and then and what maybe what data and information would be required? There's a lot of learnings that come out of those kind of regulatory sandboxes to test new things where you, the regulations maybe relaxed a bit. Um, so to understand you know all these implications and then make future decisions and policy decisions before that being scaled. So I imagine it kind of taken that kind of approach where we, we learn by doing um, and testing um, as long as all the stakeholders are understanding of kind of how are you testing and learning and being the same, on the same page with that. So, yeah. so this was number two over there. Uh, my name is Scott Monty from Maxent. Excellent presentation and excellent speakers. Thank you. And a great venue. Uh, question is, uh, we represent a lot of equity investors and lenders. And there's a two-part paradigm here. One is on the commercial market side. How do you see blockchain transforming the energy supply chain, the energy value chain, from generation, transmission, distribution, wholesale, retail customers? <coughs> so for every electron that's transmitted, the value that's given to it, so the supply and demand and all those aspects. The other side for stakeholders is the concern of structured finance, end of the day, if an electron goes this way, do I get paid? The capacity, the ability, the willingness to get paid, the transactional contracts. Uh, so these are the, some of the issues. Uh, I know we do, we're doing a lot of work with the US government on private programs overseas. And with the uh, private sector here in the US with energy and utilities. So this is a two part, uh, I would say dilemma, hope versus hype. The commercial market implications and then the the business case and business revenue model. Can you please help us? <laughs> I will take this one. Thank you. It doesn't sound, it seems like your question is less about blockchain and more around just the, the value stack uh, and, and like I think end to end kind of value chain question around how does somebody know that if I put this maybe distributed energy resource in this location, one is valuable to the distribution system. I'm going to get paid what I should be paid based on the locational value of that asset. Um, and, and then also maybe if I'm contributing a, 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 a service to the distribution utility, can I also contribute that same service to the wholesale uh, or to the NISO, for example, and capturing that value and getting all the value that, you know, 
you should be getting. And I think that conversation is taking place. I don't. I want to make sure that w what you're asking is a problem, not about blockchain, but more around kind of like the entire end-to-end -end value stack. And and as a as a service provider, how could you make sure that you're getting compensated for that? Use the sandbox principle that you're elaborating. Could that be applied to, for example, DER networks, uh, where the generator transmission distribution is under total control? For every electron that's produced, there's a guaranteed payment mechanism. Could sure. blockchain help that? Is it are you saying there's no guaranteed payment mechanism today for a service that you're providing to someone like a distribution utility? Well, you're again turning into a, I may not understand your question very well, I may have to follow up offline, but if there's a service that you're providing to the distribution utility, you know, we're, so, I believe we're required yeah. to provide, compensate for that, but right. just educating where the comp, what the value is and I should think be transparent. If we want to bring it into the, to the blockchain side, um, I think what blockchain is potentially really good at would be allowing you to bid into multiple markets at the same time and prove automatically that you have participated in those markets. And then in theory, depending on how your blockchain is set up, if you wanted to, you could incorporate automatic payments into that. Um, that is something that isn't a necessary, I think we didn't really get into a lot of this, but like the way that tokens and crypto work within blockchain and energy varies. So it can be anything from zero dollar, like zero payment happening through blockchain, just data transfers um, and confirmations all the way through, you know, total new currencies. So maybe if, to go off your example where measurement and verification of what you service you actually provided to a utility, for example, right? So if the data, your data was on a blockchain, the utility grid data was on a blockchain, then there could be a, 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 maybe a contract or an application that sits on top of it that verifies that and does all the measurement and verification and then instantly put, settles with you in terms of providing a payment for the service you provide. That, could, that speed and increasing the speed of that taking place, I think is somewhere that blockchain can really help. And, Hopefully that is. and the, the one thing I'd add is you know, getting to the value stack side of things. The value stack is obviously already there. It doesn't need blockchain. What I think blockchain can bring to it though is better exposing of the data underlying that. So until you're sort of able to see in real time what is, the, what is the value available and what is the cost to acquire that value from all those small little devices, then we don't really know the exact value stack. You can start to get approximations. Right now we're doing it sort of at the substation level, at the network level, um, and it's a really good start. You know? And you know, I applaud Con Edison and their efforts to get us there because there's not that many utilities that have done that. But where we need to go is sort of get this down to the feeder level, get it down to the meter level almost. And that is really when the value stack will be truly exposed. So, and that is when we will be able to operate the grid as efficiently as possible. Um, so I think that's a lot of the value that I think blockchain can bring to the conversation. Again, blockchain's not doing that. We could, in theory, do without blockchain, but I don't think it scales as well as if we did do it with blockchain. So I think we have a couple of more questions here, and we definitely... Right Sorry? I'll ask. <laughs> I don't have an overview of who was next, so real, real quick one, okay? I hear everyone's talking about electricity, what about gas? I've heard anything about gas, I've heard anything about wind, I've heard anything about solar, nothing all that. No, Are we just ignoring those? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, we can talk about gas for a little bit. Yeah, I can, I can take this. Um, so, well, I would say solar, solar and wind are going to feed into the electricity side. Um, on the gas side, there are things happening uh, on the supply chain side especially and um, there's some consortiums going on but yeah I mean I I think yeah I mean it's yeah I focus I mean I personally focus on grid edge but I do see things happening on the gas side but it's all much more supply chain efforts that I've seen so far to date I don't know if Con Edison does anything on the gas side so uh, I believe the only conversation and I'm not having this conversation but with the gas guys when you talk about wholesale market participation it could help on the gas side as well as on the electric side. Um, but I think that's where the conversation is with gas in terms of wholesale market participation. But other than that, it's been mostly electric, renewables, EVs, and so on. But, I mean, with, but with supply the chain, definitely. Yeah, I was actually going to say the Ponton, Ponton project I brought up earlier has gas participants in it as well. Also. And also we have, uh, if you look at uh, Japan, um, if you trade gas, you trade it there uh, up to 20 times until you, you get it into it. Japan actually, so there's a lot of margins in between, and yeah, and uh, makes a lot of 
plans to, to use them there. So okay, so I would say one last one, and then we open it up for the for the networking part. And uh, yeah, please. Okay. Uh, so could you speak very loudly? Please. Yes. Hi. Is this loud enough? <laughs> yes. So if we um, first of all, great. Everybody on the panel, I really appreciate it. If we look five years down the road and see a future where blockchain is now standardized across some distribution utilities and it's increasingly um, incorporated into just the business of managing a grid and transacting energy. Um, what's the flip side of that in terms of the, the data infrastructure requirement and how do we you know, hold on to, because those records are also, there's a lot of accounting ledgers there that are going to need to be held on to indefinitely. How do, we, how do we find a piece of land where we can just build out data centers to eternity? What's the... Actually, it's less than one giant data center. It's more like each one of our houses needs a second house for the data center. <laughs> um, it gets to what blockchain are we using? You know, it's like if we are going with this Bitcoin proof of work model, which is the one that you hear all of these voices saying it now consumes as much as the country of Denmark or some other country the next week, like that is going to be a massive issue. So I think that is why you see a lot of the energy companies shying away from using anything with proof of work and going towards proof of stake, proof of authority, new consensus mechanisms. Uh, you know, the data recording, you know, if you think about just the massive amounts of data that Con Edison has, now think about duplicating that at every single one of their users on the grid. That doesn't make much sense either. So a lot of the evolution of blockchain is going to be, how do we develop systems that are both secure, and a lot of the security right now is in the fact that I know the entire history, I can compare that with Colleen, I can compare that to Andrew, if we all have the same history, I know they're valid. Well, if, let's say, I start cutting that off at a week and say all you need is one week's worth of data, well, then how do you ensure security? So there's going to be a lot of testing around that. It's not that anyone knows the exact answer today, but it's, we know the issues resulting from some of these first generation of blockchain. And a lot of the testing that companies like us are doing is trying to figure out what is that right formula. Right now in blockchain, it sort of feels like you inherently are balancing um, data and energy usage with scalability and speed. And I'm sure there is better architectures that better match that. Um, so that's, you know, we're probably not, to be honest, we're not going to be the ones to develop it. There's so many good, really smart blockchain companies out there who are working on this. We're probably just going to steal their ideas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, too. Benefit of open source. <laughs> <laughs> oh, please. Oh, no, I think what you highlighted was the, and, and what Scott highlighted was the, the storage challenge around data, but then there's the speed at which data is coming in. Um, we talk about the closer you get to the edge of the grid, you know, how fast do I need to act? How do you, where do I get the sources of information? Um, and then that's the, one the different... That's one of the distinct advantages that we're, that we're talking about with blockchain is that speed. So compromising that becomes sort of counter to the whole you know, purpose of the blockchain. Well, so you talk about different, the different consensus mechanisms have different transactions per second, depending on how you orchestrate the network. I'm not going to solve that problem. I'm just going to buy it off the shelf. Um, but the, the, what we're talking about, I'll give you an example with our AMI network, you're talking about three point, a little over 3 million customers, 1 point something, 1.1 million gas customers or so, with a network that's looking at, with the goal is having a network having five, 50 minute informa interval information in real time. Right? And then how do I build a network to support that as well as leverage the network for other things such as other services um, with other th information like smart city applications and so on running on it. That's a serious demand on the network. Oh, by the way, we have all these other grid devices on the system right, generating data. So how do we marry all of the variability in data, um, the speed at which it's coming in, and then the storage problem is going to be a challenge I think going for it. all of that, startups are working on that. Uh, is working on that with light nodes, with uh, proof of authority, and also I think we haven't mentioned them, uh, the Energy Web Foundation, for instance. Uh, there are a lot of utilities on board. They're looking for standardized. It's still an open, but not so, yeah. Uh, it's, there are a couple of different uh, possibilities here, options on the way. I also so want to say five years is very optimistic uh, for standardization. <laughs> uh, I, have a, I have a hopeful thing to end on, though, is I think it's, it, 
is a problem, but if you think about the amount of compute that's going out in devices today, we had smart appliances years ago, but we never had any reason to really deploy them at scale. You know, for smart for refrigerators, everyone sort of looked at them and said, "That's great." It's sort of creepy that my fridge is looking at me. But you know, all these appliances, yeah, all these appliances have some amount of computation in them. So it's not necessarily that we're all going to need massive amounts of storage. It's just making use of computation that could be deployed today. But there's really no model. Like, what's the return on a smart fridge today? It's not very high. But if it could participate in some sort of utility demand response program, well, then all of a sudden that goes up, way up. And if you could imagine that with all of our devices in our homes, um, you know, I think that's really where the storage is going to be. I don't think it's that we are going to have to reinvent the home and you know, in any way other than the way it's already going. So, thank you very much. <laughs> very good final words. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Uh, I think now we uh, start the uh, network. Thank you so much. Thanks to our panelists.